The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, Ramadan Karim, and welcome to the UAE's inaugural webinar uh, for IWFM. Uh, it's four o'clock here in Dubai, and uh, we're going to have one hour probably online doing uh, what we had started to plan about two weeks ago and address mainly on COVID. The subject today uh, is basically a, a very topical question. And what we do beforehand is just to review what IWFM's purpose is of holding this webinar. Uh, the vision of IWFM is very much as a pioneering workplace and to be a trusted voice within a distinct profession. In terms of our mission, uh, the empowering and enabling of people in workplace and facilities management is by sharing of knowledge, which is what we try to do today, and allowing people to introduce leading edge thinking. Strategic aims of IWFM, there's five altogether, and these are all available in further details on the IWFM website, uh, but it's part of the distinct programmed panel of uh, mediums uh, which we're hoping to engage more so, particularly in the virtual sense, uh, over the coming year. So this is 1-20. It's the first of the 2020 webinars, and our plan is to hold them on a monthly basis hereafter. So today's is focused on sharing confidence and best practices in uncertain times. We tried to pick a, a topical subject, something that relates to everybody. Uh, we've currently got 150 plus people registered for this event and about 45 are online at present. And I'll keep you updated on that as the attendance figures go. So the first event today, myself, David Carey, as the producer, as a member of uh, IWFM and on the UAE committee. And I'll shortly be handing over to Sara Montez, who will be the moderator for today's event. And the three panelists, uh, two are uh, long-standing UAE committee members, and one is somebody who actually helped start the committee several years ago, uh, Adrian Jarvis. And I'll leave uh, Sarah to do the full introductions. So without further ado, uh, we'll start off with what's going to be IWFM and the participant introductions, which will be done by Sarah. The basic format for today will be that we'll have three questions, and each will be followed by a straw poll. So you'll see on your screen that there'll be a multiple choice, A, B, and C, it's not a full survey. We're just trying to get a general feel for how people are uh, addressing the particular topics. And for the three questions, each of the panelists has been primed with the generic topic that we're going to talk about. But other than that, they're speaking straight from the heart, representing their particular aspects of the FM sector. Uh, we'll then, after about 35 minutes, go on to a Q&A session. Uh, I encourage each of you, as you'll see on the options you have on your uh, Citrix webinar, control box is the option to be able to submit questions at any time during the presentation. You can do this. It won't interrupt our flow. And the team of those working behind the presentation will be sifting through the questions to find the two or three most topical, uh, which we'll then introduce for the panel, uh, which they won't have seen before during the Q&A session, which will last for about five to 10 minutes at the end. Uh, then we'll have closing remarks and a quick heads up of coming events. Uh, and that's it. So uh, it's a great pleasure I want to introduce you to you, uh, our moderator for today, uh, who's Sara Montez. Uh, and she's been out in the UAE for many years, uh, although originally hailing from Maybelle in the UK. Uh, she's got a lot of experience, very well regarded both uh, on client side and on service provider side. And I'll leave her to carry on and introduce the rest of the team. Thank you, Sara. Over to you. Thank you, David. Salaamu Alaikum and a very good afternoon to everybody. Um, just would like to thank all the participants and attendees that are joining us today, um, not just from the UAE and the GCC region, but from all uh, angles of the world. Um, for those of you that are observing Ramadan, a very blessed Ramadan to you too. So I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, today's discussion will include perspectives from a diverse range of industry experts who will be sharing their viewpoints. So I think it's a good time to introduce you to our panelists. Firstly, we have uh, Stuart Clayton. Stuart is a senior leader in the FM industry, um, having worked in the region for the last 13 or so years. 
Stuart is known for his passion to develop team-based capabilities and deliver exceptional strategic services to the clients that he has accumulated in his career. Um, Stuart, Stuart will be sharing his views uh, from an FM service provider's perspective. And it's also important to point out that Stuart is actually one of the founding members of um, IWFM UAE uh, here in the UAE. So welcome, Stuart. Moving on to Fahad. Fahad Mohammed is the director of FM with one of the major community management organizations in Dubai. Uh, Fahad's uh, expertise in operational and technical support spans over 14 years within the industry. And Fahad currently serves as the secretary for the IWFM UAE committee. Fahad will be sharing and giving us his insight from a developer um, slash client perspective. So welcome Fahad and thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Finally, we have Adrian Jarvis. Uh, Adrian's actually worked for the same UK-centered software company since 1998 and is the head of their regional office here in Dubai and has been here for the past 11 or so years. Uh, Adrian actually helped found the UAE chapter of WFM back in 2016. He is a regular conference panelist in comprehensive FM software technology solutions. And we're fortunate enough to have Adrian here today who will be talking to us about his experiences from a service uh, provider, solutions provider and supplier perspective. So welcome, Adrian. Thank you to all the panelists and participationists, uh, partic participants, sorry. And without further ado, let's crack on to the first point of discussion. So, first question, um, how has the pandemic impacted on your business activities? And I'd like to address this firstly to Stuart, if I may. Hello, everyone. Hello, Stuart. Uh, Hello. Hi, Stuart. Be, good to be with you today. Um, I'm gonna, we've got three, as Sarah's pointed out, we've got, and David's pointed out, we've got three questions today. I'm, I'm going to come from a, a service provider perspective, but also probably add in a little bit of my own um, kind of personal perspective on it as well, of, of, of what, how I felt about it. Um, so uh, has it, how's the kind of pandemic um, impacted on me? Um, I think from a, a mindset point of view, um, we've all have to shift We've all had to shift our kind of mindset. We've all had to shift our kind of daily and daily lives um, into understanding uh, and, and being isolated, being socially distant uh, and impaired um, from from others. Um, that's obviously had a knock-on effect from a communications perspective uh, and also from uh, an activity um, perspective as well. And even though they're personal um, uh, comments, they're also what we've seen from a service provider point of view as well. Um, as I've been talking to, to one or two, two different service providers um, around the UAE, um, one of the Im impacts that we've had is, is about cash flow. Um, work availability uh, and displacement of labor um, with the malls shutting, um, there's been a, a huge displacement of labour. The retail sector itself has, has shifted labour force away from those day-to-day um, -day shops to those that are uh, retail specialist retail shops. Sorry, to um, the day-to-day -day groceries. So a lot of um, a lot of the large retail groups have, have shifted labour that way, and it's been similar within FM in so much our cleaning teams. Uh, we've moved them away from um, kind of the day-to-day -day chores that they've been doing into more specialized cleaning. Cash flow right. has an impact, it's had an impact on revenue, it's had an impact on payments. Um, also supply chain. And I think this is individual to, to each of the companies, but some, some have struggled with supply chain. Again, because the supply chain has shut down as well um, and isolated itself as well, it, it's actually getting through to get supplies has been difficult. Uh, the availability of those supplies, as with UAE, we import most of uh, the materials that are coming into the country anyway. So again, it's been that availability. And some have, some supplies have had a, a cost uplift. But I think yeah, another that's one... Uh, sorry, Stuart, Can we, I just wanted to, to touch on that point. Um, it's a it's a very key point that you've mentioned because obviously a lot of the supplies, particularly for FM service providers, 
Um, if they are coming in late or if the costs have increased, it's going to hugely impact their business and their operations. Um, and you mentioned that you've, you've had that discussion with a few other companies. So it's something that, that obviously is across the board and has been um, unfortunately experienced by many other companies. Is that right? Yeah, the, 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 some have been able to ride it because of their relationship that they have with their supply chain, but others um, have, have struggled with it. Um, and that's a case of, because there's been such a demand more than anything, Sarah, for certain um, equipment and certain ma materials, uh, that it, it actually dried up within the country. Those materials have dried up within, within the UAE. Right. Right, and, and whatever else is available, it's it's uh, like you said, the costs have inflated hugely, so it has a major some, impact. I'm not saying all suppliers, but some suppliers have actually done a cost uplift um, because of demand. Right. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much for your um, your feedback there. I'd like to address the same question to Fahad, if I may. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, and uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, going back on the same question uh, with uh, what Stuart was mentioning again, there has been a big challenge in, in terms of uh, suppliers being uh, having cash flow issues and, and delivering the right set of services. And especially when you're managing residential uh, buildings more, we had the challenge to ensure that the, the services were up and running in, in the best possible manner. And uh, obviously, due this is the first experience for most of us, um, in, in, in especially in, in, in the FM domain. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, speculations that was being poured on, and this created a bit of a confusion or a, a sort of a scare among the service, uh, you know, agents as well. And typically, again, uh, the uh, there were quite a lot of guidelines. Thanks to uh, definitely to the UAE government, uh, there's been a lot of regulations uh, and guidelines being issued on a timely basis and actually translating them from those guidelines and actually putting them into practice. We didn't have time. We had really, really, really short time to ensure right. that. So again, the relationship between the RAPO and the communication between us and the service providers were key to ensure that things were done on the right time. And again, a lot of suppliers, uh, as, as Stuart mentioned, we're facing challenges in, 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 in securing spare parts. I mean, uh, suddenly some of the spare parts shops were closed. And unless you had stocked in the right set of uh, spare parts for an emergency repair, it was always, you know, otherwise we would have been in the limbo. So this is something that we uh, really, really had impacted uh, in the way we thought about how the whole scenario needs to be re-looked at. It and in, in future, it's definitely that's something that we really have to plan towards such uh, uh, an issue and uh, obvious for the reasons that again working from home is something not uh, very common in, in this part of the region and especially the FM service providers uh, where vital services still operating on the ground uh, whereas uh, most of us uh, who were again on the management side had to work from home and still ensure that the service on the ground was being done uh, without uh, a major impact because again, customers who are spending their time more in their in their apartments would love to see that the services are still uh, the downtime is never there, and plus right. the concern, the panic as well, because people were panicking uh, because of the the new disinfection measures. People were panicking to go into their elevators. There's a lot of communication protocols that we had to put in place to ensure that okay, fine, if there was a uh, you know, COVID condition found in the building, we had to definitely speak with the authorities uh, and, 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 and ensure that uh, there was no panic, unwanted panic created. Can, on the can, I, just, can I just touch upon that point, Fahad, because you, you've made a very uh, key statement there. Obviously, the, the guidelines and regulations that have been put forth by the authorities um, have to be adhered to by everybody. So um, we'd be interested to know, or I would definitely be very interested to know, the, the communication process how does that evolve um, from a development, uh, sorry, a, sorry, a developer's or a client's perspective? How are you actually liaising with the authorities? How soon are you getting the information? And how quickly are you able to implement the requirement? 
I think it, again, it was a very, very short window that we had because it was uh, as the guidelines came in and we had to really find our way out through as, as, as we were reported or we found a case that was reported that it was positive. So immediately we had to call Dubai Healthcare Authority. We had to liaise with Dubai Municipality, find out what exactly needs to be done. And they had guided, yes, there are the list of disinfection companies that is available. And as soon as the patient was ex 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 escorted by an ambulance, by a specialist ambulance out of the building, we had to go ahead and dis disinfect the entire place. And the other thing was we had to really rapidly look at uh, rescheduling the activities that the service providers were providing. So instead of the cleaning team giving priority on on uh, probably uh, washing the car parking or maintaining the maintenance rooms, all these resources were redeployed to uh, to look after the elevators and the main touch points or the high traffic areas and everything because that area were considered and, and, and that will give instill more confidence in, in the people who are living in the building and we had to communicate that back uh, to the residents as well. And yeah. uh, the biggest that's, challenge that's we found yeah, that's a challenge, Not trying to instill the confidence in, in the people living in the buildings. Absolutely. True, Thank you, Fahad. And second was, all right, go ahead. No, sorry, Fahad, carry on. Please finish your point. Yeah, the other one was, again, uh, avoiding rumours, because uh, we, we have, uh, especially in such a scenario, uh, the use of social media and, uh, you know, people just put a suspicion onto a group website of a building or something of that sort, and then... Uh, the rest of them catch up with with the bad news and uh, that creates a sort of a panic situation this is what we had to go back and advise the residents that you know please do not uh, post unverified information onto any social media or any platform so that's something that we had to really uh, look into and fight through uh, over the past couple of weeks right thank you for had um before I go on to Adrian, I would just like to welcome some of the late joiners. I know we've got a few people that have um, come on a few minutes late. And we've got a few people that are asking about the uh, recording of the webinar. So it's just to remind you that this webinar is being record recorded and it will be published via the website once completed. Um, and on that note, uh, Adrian, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Um, well, FSI, <clears throat> we're in a slightly different uh, uh, perspective, I guess, from uh, actually delivering services on the ground because we're providing technology, uh, a lot of it, which we can deliver uh, from uh, remotely from um, our, either our offices or now with the working from home from wherever our, our staff are, are actually situated. Um, we were quite fortunate in terms that We'd already started um, in 2019 transitioning to moving everything from physical service in our offices into the cloud. Uh, we'd adopted Office 365 across the group uh, and also chosen to stop using email as the primary medium of communication in our business. So we had already started to use Microsoft Teams um, for virtual meetings um, between our, our global offices. Um, um, but not so much on a day-to-day -day basis um, for our, our, our staff actually who are office based say uh, in, in, here in Dubai. But what um, that has uh, you know, foundation enabled us to do was uh, having trialled for a week, uh, I think half the staff in the UK working from home, we were able to um, move within 24 hours to a full working from home um, transition uh, here in the Middle East. And wow, this is not. Incredible. I'm sorry. Sorry, Age. I said that's very impressive within 24 hours. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you know because we had already put the foundations in place um, over the the, the 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 year or so before, um, we, we were in a very fortunate position. What we did have to uh, now adapt to was how our clients were geared up to actually. Um, accept delivery um, remotely. But there has been um, a, uh, a need to be actually at client sites often, because there, there, there's a sort of accepted culture of, if we can't see you, are you working for me? Um, and you know, th this change uh, to working from home 
uh, and virtual working was probably the, one of the biggest impacts that uh, we had because we saw a number of projects stall uh, initially um, because clients were saying you, you, you're not here um, you know we're, we're not going to proceed at the moment with this we'll wait until uh, um, uh, the situation has improved however as time has uh, uh, moved on both from a business development uh, and from a product delivery and support perspective that there, there's a more and more acceptance that th this technology uh, allows uh, business as usual to continue uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with, without um, you know, impacting uh, both the client uh, in terms of what they, they're getting nor uh, from an FSI perspective in what we're doing. In fact, probably we become more efficient uh, and more communicative um, as a result of uh, uh, us all being uh, isolated, working from home, but virtually talking more than ever. Wow. And you've actually made a very interesting point, Adrian, where you spoke about um, it's almost a, a cultural thing. You know, if, if people don't see you, they don't believe that you're working. Do you think that this whole working from home um, sort of period that we're going through at the moment has put back a bit more trust in the client, especially from your perspective, because as, as you said, you're doing everything, you know, from a, from a technical kind of behind the scenes, <coughs> excuse me, standpoint. Do you think that clients have got more confidence now to say that, well, you know, we don't necessarily need them to be here on site, but they're, they're doing their job um, remotely? I, I certainly think that, that that's the, the experience of uh, uh, our professional services uh, guys. Um, we're even offering training uh, remotely now, which has traditionally been very much a classroom type environment um, for, for the, the, the training on our products. Um, but you know, we've successfully now started to adapt the, the, the course content and, and the method of, of delivery of training um, so that we can again do that um, um, using virtual uh, meetings. Uh, and we're doing that not just to clients here in the Middle East, but we're doing it from the Middle East to clients in Hong Kong and in Australia. So it very much illustrates this is very much a global uh, change. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, what I'd like to do now is to introduce our participants to, to basically take part in the first straw poll which David had mentioned. So you should be able to see coming up on your screen um, the question, which I'll read out, um, with three possible answers. I'd, I'd like you just to click one. We have around about 30 seconds for you to make your choice, um, and then we'll distribute the, um, the answers uh, once we've finished. So the first thing um, that we'd like to know in terms of the straw, uh, the straw ball questions is, um, which one of the following has had the greater influence on your activities? So is it from a physical perspective, the lockdown, the whole working from home concept? Is it a mental issue, that the stress and the emotion that goes with it? Um, or is it a commercial impact um, that's obviously had a great impact on cash flow and uncertainty moving forward? Um, you know, we're, we're aware that there's been quite a few people in the industry that have either um, taken salary reductions or have unfortunately lost their jobs. So if you could please choose one of the three options and um, we'll probably be able to distribute the, um, publish, sorry, the, um, the responses in the next 10 or so seconds. I think everybody's had enough time to do that. Okay. Right, so the responses we've had thus far Oh, hang on a second. Excuse me. Very interesting. So physical lockdown, working from home and the commercial aspect is, is actually more or less even. Um, the mental stress and the emotional impact is, is slightly less. Thank you very much. Interesting insight. Thank you very much for those who have participated. So can we go on to question two? Thank you. So next point of discussion, what are the top three lessons learned by your organization? Um, Stuart, from an FM provider perspective, if we could have your input, please. 
Yeah, so um, I think it's the speed what everything changed. I think that's probably one of the, the, the lessons and the ability to actually adapt to, um, to change quickly. Um, there were macro uh, changes, the government changes on, on permits, etc. The way that that was that came into fruition within the UAE was literally overnight, um, and the organisations, the service providers have had to uh, adapt to that change. Uh, the ways of working now, okay, most of the uh, service providers over here follow the BICS uh, standards for for cleaning and and, and adopt their method of, of cleaning, but even those have be, been had to be tweaked a little bit to get the points across that it's more to do with the high touch surfaces than anything else to make sure that door handles uh, door handles now take a priority rather than the glass on the door um, so the, the the way we are the, the way we've adapted to social distancing um, certainly from a transporting point of view uh, we've got this, that social distancing there that we need to do with with the transportation and and, and the, the, the whole mindset that we've, we've had to adopt um, and it's 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 about that speed that it's happened, uh, how quickly things can change, and learning that that, that that's that. Our, our way that we adopt that change, and then also um, particularly about the IT platforms to make sure that we're up to speed with the, pretty much the, the modern IT platforms, so that we can communicate better so that we can actually make sure that the monitoring and the workload is is distributed and and, and undertaken in a uh, in an efficient manner excellent thank you Stuart. um i just wanted to touch on one of the, the points that you, made, you mentioned on the contingency planning um from my personal discussions with a few of my colleagues in the industry I've not come across any of the companies that have actually got a pandemic or epidemic listed in their sort of um, risk management, business continuity plans and, you know, sort of uh, crisis management. Do you think that's something that we should also consider moving forward for organisations to maybe learn from this moving forward? A, a little bit, sorry, yes. Um, I, I know of contingency plans that have been made where um, a whole um, busload of staff aren't available on a contract, um, so that uh, that risk and that contingency has um, been taken into account. But the actual pan, uh, pandem pan pandemic um, risk, I think, has taken the uh, the whole world by surprise globally. Uh, all yeah. organisations right across, including UK and Australia, everywhere hasn't. Um, thought yeah. that this would ever happen and I think it's taken the whole global moving forward absolutely that is something that will definitely go on to um, that kind of contingency planning and I'm, I've heard that they're already uh, talking about the, the, the ISO um, standards changing to reflect this this pandemic uh, pandemic um, kind of risk that we that we have so yeah I think it's caught everybody by surprise uh, and yeah. definitely is something that that everybody recognises is one of those that's going to go on the list. And do you think we're ready for a second wave? Inshallah, it doesn't happen. But if it does, do you think that we're ready as an industry to to be able to handle a second wave? I think the hope is that there won't be a second wave. Um, are we ready? Uh, we're a lot better prepared than we were initially. Um, yeah. Econ economy wise commercially i don't think we could cope with it with a second second wave um that really puts a, a strain on a, on a lot of people i think we need to get through this one and, and close it down and then and i know that's a, an opinion but um it, it is important that um we, we, we kind of do it and we do it right what we have got is we've got a lot of lessons learned already that we can take forward um and move into the next stage absolutely um thank you Stuart. Uh, can we get your your feedback on that please um yes sir and uh, again i mean these challenges definitely has uh, opened our eyes on 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 uh, definite on, on things that we have to be proactive 
um, and, and move at, as Stuart said at, at, at speed uh, and, and because if we are not moving in speed or at the right pace then we, we are staying behind so obviously going back to the same discussion that you had with Stuart a while ago saying that uh, virus or a pandemic to be added as part of your business continuity plan because if you look at the most of our uh, business continuity plans if it's got bomb threats it's got uh, floods it's got many many uh, natural hurdles earthquake we, we all consider that but never ever uh, you know yeah. i personally have never thought of a virus that can actually halt my entire operations or really put me into my knees so this is something that we really have to work on uh, as part of a business continuity it's not just putting that in the document but again uh, realizing that in case such a scenario happens again or such uh, you know something that happens all around the world your your transportation your logistics gets affected what do you do how what's your plan b what's your plan c so this is something that we really need to practice as 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 an industry because we are the vital sector as fm and if we stop services it's definitely going to hit uh, a lot of people uh, again so that's that's something that we have to go back and thank i mean obviously the uh, the world has been thanking the medical professionals uh, uh, and and the people who are working in hospital environments but again there's a lot of thank that you know uh, thanking that we have to do uh, to these cleaning guys and the security guys and the MEP guys who have been there during this time uh, going and disinfecting and cleaning uh, the, the area so that's something that we, we have to thank them uh, the other one uh, lessons is, is again having the flexibility Sometimes we being part of certain organizations, we put in so much of control measures and uh, the flexibility that we have might be a bit not as flexible as possible. So this is something that such such uh, during such a scenario, we, we need Hello, to Fahad? practice. Yeah, you can hear me? Hello? Hello? Are you there, Fahad? I think we might have lost Fahad. Thank you for that. Um, Hello? Take this time to move on to Adrian, please. Uh, Hi, Sarah. I, I could hear Fahad, so I'm not quite sure what, what the problem might, might be there. Um, anyway, um, in terms of lessons learned, um, top three. I, I'm, I'm sort of not sure whether we can we can actually prioritise it just into three neat, neat parcels. But uh, you know, what I think one of the main lessons we've um, uh, learned is you know embrace change. Don't be afraid of change, um, and don't be afraid of uh, adapting new practices. I, th I think like many organisations, um, you know, working from an office has been our uh, you know, normal mode of operation. Uh, allowing staff to work from home, some of the feedback we've had um, has been uh, quite surprising in terms of whilst there's a bit of a social isolation, through the, the, the use of the video technology we are keeping in touch. But not having to travel uh, has actually been a, a benefit to people and, and in some instances actually uh, help them in terms of their personal well-being. Having said that, you know, we've got to understand that doesn't work for everybody. Um, so I think one of the lessons is, you know, don't think that it's a one-size-fits-all solution to um, what will be uh, a new, new normal for people. Um, People with childcare commitments, obviously there's been uh, a big change here in terms of uh, uh, education uh, and uh, the, the home uh, uh, working for, for children or home, home learning, sorry. Um, but that's had a big impact, so that's impacted people in terms of uh, their accommodation and their, whether they, it's actually practical for them to work uh, at certain times. So a little bit of flexibility in terms of uh, um, uh, understanding uh, people's personal situations um, uh, has been certainly some, something I've learned um, very much as part of uh, um, the current situation. Um, fr from a, a virtual business as usual perspective, um, we, we made a, a conscious effort to um, have, have a, a program of contact with our clients. Um, both with the, the those that we call key clients and uh, and, uh, and ours, uh, and, and we were very pleasantly surprised about the the, the feed, feedback we got from um, asking them and just just to talk to them about how we could help, uh, 
and, and what could we do to to, to support them during this time. Um, and yeah, we've, we've been able to uh, rapidly deploy uh, some of our technology to, to assist with some of the uh, frontline work, workers and uh, um, some of our clients in terms of uh, screening of uh, their personnel. Um, so, you know, the, the client dialogue, don't, don't forget about your, your clients, I think has been a, a really important, important lesson. Um, and, you know, what started as phone calls, uh, uh, my understanding is, is moving more and more to now uh, video based meetings and virtual meetings, um, which I think is yes. a, 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 going to be an important lesson for the future for us. Absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I'd like to go on to the um, <clears throat> straw poll number two, please. So that question should be coming up for you. I'd like to also remind everybody that's listening that we do have a question and answer session at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the webinar, should I say. Um, so if you have any questions that you'd like us to put forward to the panelists, please um, feel free to drop those through. Okay, so in the meantime, we'll go on to the second straw poll. So what is the more significant benefit of holding such a webinar, in your opinion? Is it sharing experiences? So that could be sharing experiences, um, obviously, from your colleagues or other companies. Is it the ability to have inspirational ideas, um, to develop on any ideas that have come up during this uh, testing time? Um, have you identified any unsung heroes? Um, I've heard of some very interesting stories about the capability of of some teams in you know during this this time in in a crisis situation. So is it sharing experiences, inspirational ideas, or identifying unsung heroes? If you could please select one, and then we'll be able to publish the results of those. And again, like I mentioned just now, question and answer session will be happening after the third discussion point. Um, so please feel free to, to drop your questions in. We'd be delighted to respond to them. Right, I think that's enough time for the quick poll. If we could please publish those results. Wow, sharing experiences, overwhelming. Not surprising. Um, interesting, nobody's actually hit the, <laughs> hit the option for unsung heroes. Okay, all right, that's a very interesting response. Thank you very much for, for taking part. Uh, let's go on to the the third and final discussion point. So, of course, we want to look forward, um, and how do we do that? Um, what should we focus on when restoring workplace routines? Because, uh, like our pan panelists have mentioned today, I don't think life's going to be the same. Um, so, Stuart, if we can come to you first. Yeah, I, I think first of all, Sarah, we, we do need to acknowledge that it's not going to be uh, as it was. Um, life has changed. Um, the workplace and our um, places of, of social um, gatherings have changed. Um, so, so where do we go? What, what do we do? I was on the UK uh, webinar um, last week or week before. Uh, and they were talking about it. What they weren't concerned about the the control of this the the, the office or the office environment. They were more concerned about where where they tra the commute that they had. Now I know that's a little bit different here, but I think one of the things that we're going to have to look at is how we 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 commute. How do we deal with transportation of of individuals around um, around the the different sites that we have and 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 clients that we have. And another important area is about ramp for the buildings. It's so easy just to kind of go back in and switch the light switch on, but what we have to remember is that the water within the, the, the offices has been stood for a, quite a number of weeks now. So water systems may need to be flushed out, may need to be, be changed. Um, HVAC systems, there's a lot of talk about the HVAC systems, um, increasing the um, efficiencies of the filters. Um, ramping up the ventilation speeds, getting um, um, open and fresh air through op open ventilation. Um, so those are the kind of things that we're going to have to look at. But we're going to have to do it in consultation with our customers and with our clients. We're going to have to engage them. We don't know their plan of attack because every single client that we have will be different. 
So we're going to have to engage with our customers, as Adrian mentioned, and, and kind of understand where their what, what's their priorities about bringing people back and bringing and, and reopening their their workplace uh, that they're okay. into. Uh, okay. And I think, and I think finally, really for me, it's more about retaining this flexibility that's been kind of. I don't want to use the word forced. Um, I, I'm sure there's a better word than that, but it's a kind of where we are now. We we have suddenly come across a lot better communications. Adrian's mentioned about that they don't travel as much now and they've been doing a lot more video conferencing, etc., and engaging their customers through that. And I think that will be the that will quickly become the norm, is is what I'm saying. Um, that that flexibility to retain. People have still got school children and they'll still be home teaching right through till September. So to expect people to come back to the office and come back to their workplaces on a full-time basis and then school their kids at home as well is going to be very difficult. So we're going to have to retain this flexibility that we have at the moment. So for me, it's about ramp up. It's about engaging customers. It's about this transportation and being socially aware um, uh, and uh, being consciously isolating and uh, obviously retaining this flexibility that's suddenly come around. Thank you, Stuart. Um, moving on to, to Fahad. Hi, everybody. And uh, again, uh, thanks, uh, Stuart. That's a really valid points. Uh, again, just I, I do really don't want to reiterate what you said. What you said is really important that we really have to look in into uh, every system, uh, our disinfection methods, our MEPs, our HVAC system, uh, you know, get it up and cleaned before the people start moving in. Uh, the, the point I would like to make is, again, a strict adherence to the local regulations. Um, a lot of notices, guidelines are put up there. It's a discussion that's on every media. But again, uh, we have a habit of ignoring certain things. We, we just start taking things for granted. Uh, this is where we as FM professionals have to keep um, uh, informing and creating awareness among uh, the people that they have to take uh, sufficient care and follow the guidelines. So it's, it's, it's about putting that to practice. So use of right now, obviously the 30% uh, offices are working. So again, people commuting from their home to their workplace, uh, the, the government uh, and the regulation states that they have to wear uh, the mask at all times and, and the, uh, the gloves are optional. Again, there's this, it's, it's not about just wearing the gloves. Again, you need to take sufficient care while wearing them and disposing them. So these are certain things that we need to bring in. We, it, it's again our job as community professionals to install uh, signboards or posters or display them and create that awareness among people that how they have to be more careful in, 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 in washing their hands, the use of uh, sanitizers, how they should be more careful in, in, in using public toilets, uh, and which will again affect, uh, you know, and them as well as the, the additional users that come in. And not only that, our cleaning staff who goes in to clean them, they also need to take protection, you know, they need to be protected as well. So it's, it's about creating that awareness, creating that culture among everybody. Again, it's the, the, it's the new norm. So earlier we used to walk in and shake hands and hug each other, but today it's, it's different. So we, we, we keep a distance yes. from talking to people. So that's something that... It's uh, elbow bump, <laughs> we, apparently. That's the, that's the phrase, isn't it? The elbow bump. <laughs> True, the elbow bump and, and those sort of things. But again, I mean, this is the new norm. And uh, we just need to adhere and uh, educate and create awareness among uh, our peers. So that's, that's the most important thing that I believe uh, is going to happen in our workplace. Thank you, Fahad. Just a, a quick point there. I mean, obviously, yourself and Stuart, you both mentioned things in relation to the whole social distancing. Um, as companies are running on limited staff, I think it's around about 30% capacity that are allowed back in the office now in, in Dubai. Do you foresee um, some sort of uh, leniency in terms of what, what companies are going to, to look at, at um, maybe reducing manpower numbers, reducing staff numbers? Um, do you think there's a possibility of uh, 
making reductions in, in, in their corporate head offices in terms of the staff numbers because they've been, able, they've been able to operate without all of these people. The use of technology is there. Do you think that's a, a likely outcome? It, it's, it's, it's a very subjective question, Sarah, because it's purely depending on the operations that you have. For me, for example, from a community management perspective, we yeah. have been operating from home on a full-fledged level. So everybody has been working. I don't think so. we've been uh, you know, restricted to eight hours in the past one month that we spend at home working. We have more. We're putting a number of hours. I could see emails popping in from people, which sometimes are healthy as well. From 10 o'clock at 11 o'clock at night, people are... Uh, you know, you used to, for example, myself, I had was used to a routine where you you walk out of your house and you, you have an engaging day, but when you're at home, you, you feel something different and then you, you try and focus more on work, probably in the late hours as well, which is unhealthy. But yeah. uh, but again, to answer your question, it's very subjective. It is purely, purely depending on the operations. For example, us, we had a lot of things to, you know, to be done in that period. Uh, to, uh, to do a lot of clearance of payments, to ensure that the service providers were working, uh, to do the collections. So many things were there. It depends on the organizations. I think the retail uh, companies are affected heavily uh, because of the shutdown, because they didn't want staff in there, uh, the, the, especially the outdoor salespeople. They are facing the challenge uh, who are, uh, you know, walking from door to door, from, uh, you know, retail shops to retail shops, etc. So there is definitely a challenge in the market, but it's, yeah. it's purely... Uh, it's business dependent. Absolutely, absolutely. Understood. Thank you very much for your feedback, uh, Fahad. Um, and finally, going on to, to Adrian. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I very much agree with um, what, what Fahad was uh, uh, talking about in terms of uh, you know, uh, the new normal. Um, I'm not sure we know exactly what that's going to be yet, um, you know, but, but certainly things are going to be very different. Um, you know, a lot of us have open plan offices. Um, you know, are we going to revert back to cubicles, which were um, rejected uh, um, a number of years ago because they they weren't very conducive to to staff uh, relationships and uh, um, productivity? Um, will we be reducing staff? As Farhad was saying, I think our team have been working at the same level, if not a greater level, uh, from yeah. home. Um, so reducing staff, maybe not, but absolutely having flexibility about whether people need to be in the, in the office uh, every day of the week, uh, I think will become um, uh, more uh, normal yeah. for us. So we may not have a full team in um, uh, you know, every day. We may have half the team in um, from one, one department, for example. Uh, or yeah. people may be able to choose when they come into the office uh, and use technology to book uh, uh, what will be, uh, I suppose, a form of hot desk. You know? um, I, I think, you know, from a technology spec perspective, we, we're going to see quite a lot of apps come into um, uh, the workplace. Um, I already mentioned the, the booking type of app, but, but also welfare apps. Um, you know, we did a screening app for one of our clients here to... Uh, record um, uh, the temperature of people and automatically record them against their, their personnel record. Um, but I'm talking more about a wellness daily health check, almost um, like a vehicle check, if you like. You take a company vehicle out, you know, have you checked the oil, have you check, checked the water in the windscreen wipers, have you checked the tire flashes? You know, are you feeling well enough to be in the office? You know, uh, have you been in contact with people that haven't been well? Um, you know, booking your time uh, at home um, in a flexible way. So it's, it's not nine to five, it, you know, it, it's uh, as far ahead saying, people sending emails at 10, 11 o'clock at night is not necessarily healthy, but it might work for some if they've got childcare uh, uh, issues. Right. Uh, yeah. So it, it, there's a lot of flexibility. You know, I don't think we're gonna go back to, to the way it was before. We, we had a substantial amount of travel uh, for our uh, professional services and sales um, people. Uh, I think uh, there will be travel, but it will be reduced and perhaps much more um, planned than, than uh, expected. You know, I think uh, certainly regionally it's been expected that you have to travel and see someone um, face to face. But I, I'm sure that uh, that is not going to be the new normal. It's going to be um, uh, you know 
increased use of the video um, virtual reality meeting um, as opposed to face to face. So. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. No, it's, it's it's interesting that that you know you yourself and Fahad mentioned that because um, as you both mentioned or you both stated, there's a lot of people that are working from home and can work from home, and some organisations, as opposed to sort of reducing staff numbers, could maybe consider reducing their corporate office size if it's not no longer required. If if there is an um, incentive to to save costs at this difficult time, so that's one of the reasons I asked the question. But thank you, Adrian. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. So if we can just go on to our final straw poll. So fingers at the ready, guys. <laughs> what will the post-COVID-19 recovery process be for you? Um, is it going to be business as usual? Um, very unlikely as, as per our panelists. I don't think anything's going to be going back to usual, but that may be the case for some of you that are listening. Will you be having some re-engaging issues or will there be a major revision of workplace routines? So please choose one of those and we will publish the responses in a few seconds. Um, in the meantime, I understand that we have got quite a few questions that are coming in. Um, and we have streamlined a few of those questions. So uh, we'll put those forward to the panelists shortly once we come back with the uh, results of this quick poll. So if we could maybe publish those now, see how we've done. I think everyone would have responded by now. Oh, so we have got a few people have actually replied with business as usual, which is interesting. Be interesting to know um, what fields they're uh, responding from. And, you know, as expected, a major revision of workplace routines is the overwhelming uh, majority. So just just like to thank everybody for the, uh, the discussion points. And also for your contribution in the straw polls. And um, we'll start to look at some of those questions. If you could just bear with me a few seconds. Okay, Sarah, um, I've been monitoring the questions as we come again. We've got about 15 altogether so far, uh, ranging from uh, 12 different people. Uh, the first question uh, for the panel uh, relates to uh, the same topic from about three or four different people. Uh, first was from uh, Yusuf uh, Haji Ibrahim, uh, also Vizier Hussain, and it's basically expectations from the clients relating to the contracts is if the KPIs are tough and they're still at above 90%, and in order to keep costs down because of change of circumstances, uh, a service provider can only use less manpower or there's conflicting priorities against budgets. Uh, what needs to give, essentially, is the question, uh, because you can't have consistently higher quality of service delivery with less budget and less resources. So what does the panel think is the silver bullet for each of those circumstances? Thank you, David. Can we start off with, um, with Stuart, please? Um, yeah, it's a difficult one, David, to be honest. Um, I think because of the practices that we are, the services that we deliver, let's start that way. So hard FM, soft FM, uh, those service delivery streams i don't see those particularly changing much in the way that they're delivered there's still the requirement to maintain the assets that we have within the building so i don't see there being much change to kpis or the way that those are worked um even from a cleaning perspective um i i, I don't see that I, I only see that the practices will that we've put in for COVID will actually continue. Um, so I, I don't think there should be too many difficulties. Now, I, I get the conversations going down the route of, well, you've had less resources, but you're still giving me the same. Well, no, we haven't. Because from, from my perspective, what we've done is we've reduced the level of service so that we could meet the social um, thing. So, uh, so meet the social distancing and the guidance and the regulations and all the all the um, 
parameters that have come in. Um, if we're going back to where we were, then there is no difference. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for, for that insight. And uh, Fahad, over to you. Uh, in the short term, obviously, during this period of time, uh, we have definitely relooked at uh, the service levels and uh, it will be adjusted. And this is, again, a condition that is beyond our control or beyond the service provider's control. So this is an emergency period, we understand. But in the long term, uh, it, it, it depends at whether it's going to affect the KPIs or not. We, we really have to work on it. But on a short term approach, yes, uh, there is uh, flexibility and fairness on the KPI should be applied. This is what I believe in because the priorities have changed. Wonderful. Thank you, Fahad. And uh, Adrian, if we could get your opinion on that. Well, but perhaps this is a time where it will uh, further. Um, drive output specifications rather than input specifications. So measuring on whether you have, for example, um, on a cleaning basis, um, you've actually visited an area and sanitized it and you've been able to prove that by using uh, a form of te technology, maybe a QR code or a, an NFC tag to show that you've been to the area. Um, yeah. And perhaps have a route or something like that. I think yeah, as Stuart said, SLIs and KPIs, they're not going to go away. Uh, they, they might mature uh, and become a way of finding points of pain rather than um, using it as something to uh, uh, beat the client, uh, sorry, the supplier up from the, uh, by, by the client uh, and, and identify mutually where, where there are uh, areas of improvement. Um, mm. So, you know, I think perhaps a, a, a move, move more to understanding yeah, output is more important than input, um, is what we might see. Yeah, and, and I, for one, I'm very excited to see all of the technology and the, the, the developments um, that, that come on the, the scene, as it were, as a result of what we're going through now. Uh, thank you for that, um, Adrian. Okay. I think we've only got time maybe for one more question, David. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Over, over to okay. you then. So so question number two, which I've melded uh, with submissions from uh, Prasanth Bethi, Talal Al-Barashid and uh, Avanav Singh. Uh, again, similar type of topic and what we're talking about, particularly for the younger FN managers and those who've never been through a recession or a crisis like this before, is uh, how can one best learn and draw information uh, when there's such a shortage of sources because as was touched on earlier, many companies don't have contingency plans. Uh, and in particular, uh, where's the best guidance will to go for how, for how to get your staff and uh, FM teams to learn quickly how to deal with very anxious end customers. They've all got opinions, the staff have got rules, uh, and they've all got to learn new routines. So where would you guide uh, your uh, fellow workers or your uh, employees and resources, where would you guide them as to how to be trained to deal with these changed circumstances? Okay, so can we direct that firstly to Stuart, please? Um, to a point, I think that's already been done and the lesson learned to, is, is that it's been done. Um, we've already gone through that change. Um, the uh, like I say, it, it's it's changing the mentality and and having that cooperation and that it, it is tool. It's about training, regular training, communication, having regular communication. Um, it's it's all those things. Toolbox talk, going through the toolbox talk. What we need to understand now, from a cleaning perspective, is high touch services, uh, high touch surfaces, should I say, um, more than just making sure that a floor's been mopped. It's about making sure door handles and, 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 and light switches and, and those items have become suddenly more important than making sure that a, a piece of vinyl is, is polished up. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Fahad? Yeah, I, I guess it's uh, about uh, evolution. I mean, uh, obviously, everything at the first time, so we have gone through it. We started receiving certain guidelines from different parts of the world, from WHO, from different universities across the world. 
uh, in time, I believe uh, IWFM um, will have one. I mean, it's already started publishing certain guidelines. Uh, I've seen ASHRAE has published uh, a bit um, mostly on the HVAC uh, side that what needs to be at one, what needs to be taken care, etc. I think a lot of these professional bodies have already started relaying information and putting our guidelines out there uh, so that what we can actually take up and use those guidelines to develop further guidelines which will be more apt for our sort of organization and our, yeah. our sort of operation. Yeah, and that, and that's a key point. It's about the, the involvement and the development all the time because we, as, as we're moving forward, we're learning so much more about this whole disease and, and the impact that it's had. Thank you, Fahad. Um, and if we could just round up with Adrian, please. Um, yeah, I, I'm really totally with Farhad. You know, the, the professional bodies are, is the place to get a lot of this uh, knowledge and information from. Um, uh, as, as he was highlighting, many of them are already um, offering or, or drafting uh, best practice guidance. Um, you know, I think we, we need more uh, events like this so we can uh, share knowledge and share uh, experience uh, and help people um, <clears throat> you know, who have got uh, less experience learn from others who've got, uh, got greater knowledge um, and uh, you know, um, get that guidance that uh, you know, we all seek um, to, to, so that we can improve and uh, do our jobs better. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we won't be able to take any more questions. Um, as I mentioned before, the webinar will be, or is being recorded, should I say, um, and will be published on the website. I just want to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, um, Stuart, Fahad and Adrian. We very much appreciate your time. Thank you to all the attendees and the participants for joining us. Um, I'd like to thank our support team. Uh, David Kerry, as, as probably you all, you all know, um, is the producer. We've got a great support team in the UK that have helped put this webinar together. Our regional sponsors, um, Adib, we've got BFM, uh, Mace Macro, and a few of the others. Um, I'm not going to point them all out, but they're there mentioned on your screen just purely because of we're short on time. So thank you very much for all joining. And we look forward to seeing you in future events. And I'm going to hand you over to David, who will tell you about what's going to be coming up. Um, so you know you can keep a, a note for your calendars. Thanks again, and goodbye to all. OK, lovely. Thank you very much, Sarah, for being the moderator today. Um, have a virtual clap all round for your uh, stunning performance. Uh, for your diaries, folks, coming up on the IWFM UAE group, if you're not a member of it, please browse for that on LinkedIn. Also keep track that there are uh, other webinars being run by uh, the parent organization within the UK. So 6th of the May, the next one for your diary. Uh, it's now coming up every two weeks. There's a webinar. Uh, on Tales of the Front Line on the 13th of May. For everybody's diaries, there is the World FM Day, supported by IWFM. 27th of May is our next webinar, which will be two of 2020, uh, in which the title and the details will be published shortly. So please have a look at iwfm.org.uk for all upcoming news. Uh, the LinkedIn IWFM UE group for further details. And that's it for today. We're a couple of minutes over our scheduled deadline for a first attempt. I think that's a, a pretty good result. Thank you so much to all of you who are there. We had 65 online altogether out of 151 who were originally uh, registered. So thank you for participating. Have a great day. And uh, Ramadan Kareem for all our Muslim uh, colleagues. And stay safe, stay sane, stay at home. Thanks all.